So, I'm at home yesterday uh, and I get a phone call from GQ saying David Lammy's made this extraordinary speech in Parliament about the Windrush uh, generation. Why don't we do him? So that shows in its own little way that speeches in Parliament still matter. They absolutely matter. I mean, I try to do my speeches from a heart place. Right. I try to not talk on things I know nothing about. Right. So I'm pretty focused on the things that people associate with me. And I guess I am very much in the, you know, I have a faith. I'm in the kind of slightly... A God faith. A God faith. Right. <laughs> I'm in a sort of, um, you know, slightly evangelical... Okay. Tradition, which is why I don't stand there reading notes. It right. comes from somewhere. Okay. And then the next day, you have these extraordinary speeches from Luciana Berger, Ruth Smith, and others in the anti Semitism debate. And I was wondering, when are we going to hear decent speeches in Parliament from either of the front benches? What is going on uh, in our Parliament? It is a parliament where the action is on the back benches. But is that about the back? Is that because the front I, benches are so I poor? I think it's. Uh, I think that well, two things. The first thing is, um, it's a bloody small majority, right? So this is a parliament in which um, back benches have a serious amount of power. They have power on the conservative side. Clearly, people like Anna Soubry, um, who, who I would agree with, um, yeah. uh, and, and sadly, people like Jacob Rees Mogg. On our side, let's be clear that we, yes, we've got the Labour Party, but within the Labour Party, there are two differences of opinion. Um, and therefore, people like Chris Leslie, people like Chukar um, uh Jonathan Woodcock, these people have, have, a, have, have power. And okay. so there's action on the back benches. But let's Whatever be... you think about the front bench. Okay, but so, so tell me, when was the last, after, I've mentioned three speeches that I can say just from recent days, when was the last front bench speech from either side that you heard and you thought, wow, impressive? I can't remember. That's terrible. It is, in the sense that I have, I know it's terrible, but what it is is certainly um, I can think of in my period front bench speeches from Gordon Brown, from Tony Blair. Um, William Hague? From William Hague, even. That captured a particular moment mm. that I, I can't, front benches have not been able to do that in the, in the mm. recent times. I mean, have you ever felt that politics is as bad as it is at the moment? Or is that just me getting old? No, politics is terrible. Politics is, I, I, I never imagined that politics would be where it is. Pol we are fractured, divided, um, extreme in places on we both sides. Weakly led. On both um, sides. Leadership is found in lots of different places. Then it's not just found in the sort of it's not in terribly hierarchical in some senses actually. Um, the, all the dust is up in the air and it hasn't settled basically uh, as both the country and the political establishment. And you know there are definitely days when I sort of think, what, why am I doing this? This is this is this is taking its toll. It's it's, am I getting anywhere? Um, and actually some of the forces out there I would describe as almost evil. I mean, they're evil. So... What are you talking um, about? Racist policy forces? Xenophobia. Xenophobia. Racism. Um, a serious amount of malevolence. Um, Wait, so where's that all coming from, do you think? People say social media, but it's not, it's not social media, is it? It doesn't start with social media, does it? It starts with... Um, a period of time in which um, a significant chunk of the country is left behind. That is both a north-south divide, it seems to me. Um, it is... It you're is in a, the south, in one of the poorest parts of the south, in some ways. I am, yeah. but I recognise that if, you're, if you are in parts of Rotherham, if you are in a seaside town, if you are in places very different to Tottenham, even though in London terms, obviously I represent a yeah. very, very tough, poor seat in many ways, um, you are out of the story. Right. There is, I think, the story is about an asset class, mm -hmm. people who have nice houses in, in London, um, who have relative wealth, 
mm. people who are, you know, pretty well educated, went to Russell Group, they, they got a lot, but quite a lot of people who are not in that story. And then the other side of that is also the millennials. But even those people, they may feel left behind, but malevolence or evil, as you call it, most people aren't that. No, they're not. So where's so, that coming from? So you then put into the mix um, forces that seek to exploit those people uh, over the last 10 years. So clearly, since the economic downturn, yeah. there ha, ha, you know, th there's an old story, which is the reason your, your life is not what you thought it would be is because these people robbed you, these people took your job. The bankers. The, or the I'm, I'm now talking or about both. the immigrants. So or, bo or both, you yeah. could cut it both ways. Yeah. Um, these people have it and you don't have right. it. Um, and clearly, it seems to me, from what I see and feel, that social media drives it that. Ventilates it. Uh, ventilates it. And indeed, it's clear that there are external forces mm. in other countries, like Russia, mm -hmm. who want to amplify that. They, yeah. I see my tweets sometimes amplified mm. in order to sort of encourage yeah, this yeah. tribal war. So UKIP, right-wing press, they're the kind of domestic forces, then you've got these other international forces pushing this kind of malevolence into our politics. I think so, and I think there's also a kind of really depressing, supine, um, um, liberal middle class who acquiesce yeah. and put up with it, and there are institutions of state, big important ones, like, like the BBC, yeah. that do not appear to be as impartial, um, as um, uh, driven to establish a kind of impartial truth, mm. as you would have. As so, you what you think? Are you thinking in particular about Brexit on that? Or? I'm definitely thinking about Brexit, but I'm also thinking about an age in which, um, you know, race wars, celebrity salaciousness crashness, crudeness, all even, of those things. Even across the BBC, you would say? I, I would include the BBC in that cell. Yeah. That sells. That's entertainment. So it's, Cliff Richard's getting the, arrested? Yeah, it's the, yeah, it's the Trump, Trump kind of world yeah. in which that, that disease, this is the business you were in, has infected everything. That's why I hate it. But it's nothing like, I mean, it's got worse and worse and worse and worse. What about, um, just on, on, on the leadership, though, would you, would you say this is the worst government you've ever known? Competence-wise and, and, you know, recent events notwithstanding, even before that, you know, a little bit of inhumanity in what they do as well. It's a government that seems to lack a serious amount of empathy and compassion. It's a government that's allowed itself to be swallowed up entirely by one agenda, um, so whatever you think about Brexit now, there are so many things in Britain that need fixing and yeah, need sorting. And I'm it. telling you now, not they're not being fixed. debated here. They're mm. not being discussed here. There are no policy proposals. Um, so we're because really, all they can do is Brexit. All they can do is Brexit. Mm. And even Brexit, they're not doing particularly well. No. So in that sense, it's it, 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 it's it's a broken it's a broken right. government. But then you, so you've got her there. Then you've got Jeremy Corbyn opposite. And you know, is your neighbouring MP still a friend? I, let's just establish first off. I am a really crap tribal politician. Right. Um, I'm I'm not. Crap you're at being tribal. You're, 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 no, I'm finding it hard. <laughs> I'm finding it really hard. I. I did not grow up delivering Labour Party leaflets, joining the Students' Union. Right. That is not the tradition I mm -hmm. am from. Mm -hmm. I grew up poor, black, working class, had to work damn hard to stay out of prison. Um, dad left you? My, my dad left, yeah, problem with booze and other things. Uh, you know, I, I was always Labour, mm. but... I find it hard some of the wars that people have been fighting since they were since they were since they were sort of kids or yeah. at, 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 or you know in the unions or whatever. This I'm is not a long answer. Is he still but, a but, friend? But, but, but so what I want to say is that my interaction with Jeremy Corbyn and there are a lot of people in the PLP who do not know Jeremy Corbyn. Mm -hmm. I know Jeremy Corbyn because he's my neighbour. Sure. 
I know Jeremy Corbyn because he used to be a councillor in the London Borough of Haringey. Yeah. And my day-to-day contact with Jeremy Corbyn is one of, uh, he is pretty loved in his own constituency. Yeah. Bloody good constituency MP. Um, someone that, I'm also someone who works beyond, yeah, yeah. you know, we, we worked on a number of things together. So is he still my friend? Yes, he is. Mm-hmm. He is still my friend. Uh, we text each other. We have, you know, you know, we talk about the theatre and things that, you know, way beyond politics. He is still my friend, yes. And can you imagine him being Prime Minister? Jo- I think Jeremy Corbyn's going to be Prime Minister. My take on you this... You do think he'll be yes, Prime Yes, and the people... I've, I've been saying that for a very you long have, time. And do you think he'd be a good Prime Minister? Do Ooh. you feel comfortable with the idea that Jeremy Corbyn's going to be Prime Minister? On behalf of my constituents, yes, Alistair, because my constituents want some socialism. That's what they want. Um, will it work? I don't know. Um, is, the, is the experience necessary to deliver change fully there across our front bench? Question marks. Um, Could you name them all? But, but, <laughs> but I've said to you, I'm, I don't want to play that game. But, but in terms of the agenda, hmm. up for something different, and also in terms of being prepared to say hmm. that the centrist project ran into the sand and ran out of ideas and felt quite shrill by the end, um, I think I'm, I'm very, very up for saying that. So, um, you know, in that sense, when Jeremy says he thinks the centre ground has moved, I think there's some legitimacy in that. Mm. Um, and I think it's also... Do you know what we should do a little bit more to defend and promote the record of government that you were a part of? I do think... Because I think politically it's daft. Yeah, I, look, yeah, I do think that all political parties are a coalition and if you want to be in government you want to go in with the biggest tent possible yeah. because the tent well, not, shrinks he's not, he's from not, day one right well, he's not doing that, is he? <laughs> and if you he's start... not exactly he's not exactly re- the, he, his people are not exactly reaching out to build a bigger tent they're basically saying if you don't love being inside this tent you can piss off that is the feeling people who are not in the tent get and that's no way to win an election you might say that. I am going to avoid the kind of personality stuff. Well, um, that's policy, isn't it? That's politics, isn't well, it? Are we reaching out to the sort of people we're going to need? You're, look, you've got 82% of the share of the vote at the last election. Yeah. What about all these guys in marginals? What about all these guys who should have won but didn't? How, who's going to vote for them that didn't vote for them last time, based on what we're seeing from Labour now? Well, we did better. In yeah, the general election, for sure. that most of those people Except predicted. That. Except that. Most of those people predicted. But we're we went, still going to have to do better we still. Went, yes, we are. We are going to have to do better so still. So, how's that going to happen? We, uh, that's not for me to answer. What I can tell you is this I've seen our party riven with internal war and civil war. Um, we came out um, of, of, of the Brexit vote mm. fighting to try and, a, a group of people trying to try and get rid of, of, of Jeremy Corbyn. I understand why that happened, but I didn't participate no. in it. What I did was I fought Brexit from day yeah. one. Well done. And I've avoided the party warfare stuff. Mm. And I'm not about to get into it now. Okay. It's not in the interest of my constituents. It's not really David Lammy. I don't think it's what people expect from David Lammy. Oh, hey, 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 David, 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 David be aware it. talking about yourself in the third person. <laughs> that's enough. I don't think that's I'm, enough. Quite gone. I'm not quite gone mad. <laughs> But what I'm saying is, it's, yeah. I just, just don't think it's, I'm not the yeah, best yeah. party animal. I understand. Honest. Right, okay, but Brexit. So Brexit. You cannot be happy with the way the Labour Party has handled Brexit. No, I'm not. I mean, it's dire. No, I'm not. Uh, look, I think that... Um, you think it's a disaster. What we're seeing is a tyranny, basically. It's a tyranny that um, is bound to end in deep, economic problems for many poor and working people across the country. So why is the Labour Party not doing more to stand up against it? Yeah, look, I'm absolutely clear that um, I think the best thing for us to be is in Europe. Mm -hmm. I think that the Labour Party has to be internationalist. The Labour Party has also got to stand up to some of the forces behind Brexit, which I find to be racist and xenophobic. Um, Look, I recognise, however, that I don't lead the Labour Party. And that as I say that, there at least 
you know, after the Brexit vote, there were colleagues, particularly in northern seats, um, but also in places like Wales, mm. um, that voted to leave. Sure. I think that position's changing, I have to say. I think people are recognising... Well, imagine how, how much more it would change if, if the Labour front bench were pushing it in that direction. Well, yeah, absolutely. So, um, and, and he's, like, he's our most left-wing leader ever, and yet not a proper, in my view, not properly opposing an incredibly right-wing agenda now. Yeah. Which is what Brexit's going to be. But again, Alistair, this is where you and I might be slightly different. I have simply tried to stay on the issues. I've been absolutely clear where I sit in the ground. Yeah. I've voted against Article 50. Yeah, I've know. voted against party positions. Yeah. I've watched party positions moved, but I've not personalised it. I've okay. not personalised it related to Keir Starmer the or, in, or related to Jeremy. Okay, I understand that. But so let, let's so I've been slightly different to some. You sure. Know, that's all I'm saying. No, I try yeah. not to be personal. Yeah. But I think on the issue, I feel it so strongly that, uh, that my tribalism really is being tested on all sorts of things, anti-Semitism, this and other things. But when it comes to the deal, would you feel as I feel that if the Labour Party facilitates what we already know is going to be a bad deal? I'll be voting against it. No, but would you, I, I don't know if I could stay in the party on that basis. I'll have to consider that at the time. Uh, but uh, but I, I felt a foreigner in my, my own party from day one. Um, what, June the 24th? Absolutely, mm. absolutely. Um, I felt very, very lonely indeed. Because I said it was madness right from the beginning. Mm. Um, and still think it's madness. Um, could you ever imagine not being Labour? You say you're not tribal, but could you ever imagine not being Labour? I find it hard, but... I think that the Labour Party is the best vehicle for progressive change in our country. Yeah. However... That does not make it a kind of ordained, permanent feature necessarily of politics. Um, parties come and parties go in our history. Uh, that can happen. Um, Do you think if we carry on down this road with a hard Brexit Tory party and a, a le very left-wing Labour party facilitating Brexit, that it does open up that I ground? think the dust is going to, you know, sorry, the, well, the rubber's going to hit the road in the autumn. Mm. when um, we get a deal, and I suspect it's going to be a crap deal. Has to be. Um, um, There's no other deal on offer. Because office. any negotiation I've been into, if you're on your knees from day one, the deal ain't going to be very good, right? Um, and at that point, there will be a reckoning. There'll be a reckoning for, for yeah, our the, party, the, but there'll be a very big reckoning for the government. Right, but you're not and worried so, this, this transition, this two-year transition is just like a trap and... The, oh, well, well, we'll sort it out in the next two years, and then we're out. And I then think, we're knackered. I, I think people are, can probably see through that. Okay, hope so. I think Europe can probably see, see, see through that to some extent. Um, I still think the rubber's going to hit the road in the autumn, and at that point, we will see where the Labour Party so is. So do you think there response. is a possibility that we might not leave? I bloody hope there's a possibility. Do you, there is, do you think I'm there fighting is? very hard for a possibility. We don't leave. Do you, Absolutely. And do you, do you back the... Of course there is. Good. Do you think the... And did you, do you back the idea of the, the People's Vote campaign that was... Started? Absolutely. Again, you know, uh, right from day one, I felt there had to be some mechanism for a determination of the deal that we actually get. Mm. Okay. And that seems to me either Parliament or it seem, or it's the people voting on that deal. Yeah. Um, so I'm very comfortable with that. And let's just talk about the, the anti-Semitism thing. I mean, how have we got into a position where the left, the party of the left in the UK, is the party now identified with anti-Semitism? How the hell has that happened? I went across the road to the to the protest yeah. um, and joined Jewish friends that I've yeah. known for many years. And I got over there and actually I was sort of filled, I, I almost sort of burst into tears because we were in this d terrible, terrible moment. I sat in Parliament um, recently for the for the debate around anti-Semitism, listened to people like Luciana Berner, Ruth Smee, unbelievable. Um, we are in this position, clearly, because there is a tradition that exists on parts of the hard left that is deeply, deeply 
um, anti-Semitic in attitude and background. That is why? the truth. Why? I can't tell you why. I'm not. I'm not an expert on it. Um, but where does it um, come? I mean, I get the thing about Israel. Well, it, it, but actually being anti-Semitic, I just do not understand it on any level. Well, I, I only understand. I mean, now you hear about it every Labour Party meeting you hear about. Yeah. Well, I understand it as an ethnic minority. I understand it as a as a as a series of stereotypes that are permanent. That where people look at you and assume that you're lazy, assume that you're thick, assume that you're a womanizer, um, and, and that you're out to steal their wife or something. Yeah. All of these stereotypes I have lived with all of my life. And in the same way, there are a group of people who assume when you were Jewish that you were part of a wider conspiracy. Right, but the um, racism you've felt down the years is most black people have felt that over the last few, well, in the last few decades. Most Jewish people over the last few decades, when you wind back to the war, it's got a lot better rather than any worse. So why has it come back? It's come back because extremism has come back. And um, anti-Semitic tendencies exist largely on the hard right mm. and the hard left of the political spectrum. That's, that's just what history tells us. Right, and why is, and why, why is our, why has it happened on the watch of, do you think that this leadership has tolerated and fostered it? I think that there are moments in politics that require leadership, that require indicating a change of mind, um, a genuine sorry, but then a series of actions. And some of those actions are frankly, and it's brutal, um, turning on people who may have been friends. So Ken. Um, Ken Livingston's definitely the number so he one. Be out. Cult. out, out, months and months and months ago. And he's a friend of yours. Was he was a friend of mine? Yeah. yeah, but gone. But that's not happened. No. And three these three hundred cases are they going to get dealt with properly? We don't know. That's what I say about tolerating. Well, fostering. We 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 have lost a community um, that will that I I think will will not be coming back anytime soon. I represent um, the Stamford Hill area of mm. of, of of London. Is that in your seat? That's, that's in my seat wow. and Diane Abbott's seat. It's, it, Stanford Hill is in two places. Right. You know, it's across Haringey and Hackney. Um, and they normally be, generally they vote for you. No, right? those people vote for me. Yeah. Are you uh, losing them? Of course. Of course. They're, 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 there's deep trauma in Jewish communities in relation to And they're not rich. Deep, deep. They're very poor community. <laughs> very poor community. Um, who need actually a good Labour mm. government. Let's be clear about mm. that. Um, but you know the, the ball has run away from us and it will take serious serious leadership mm. and let me just be absolutely clear um, those who suggested online that I should be deselected mm. for for joining the protest with a minority group mm. are out of their minds I will never ever stop standing with Jewish friends you know I have spent my whole political career Mm. standing with minorities. Mm. There is a powerful tradition in this country, in the United States where Martin Luther King mm. uh, marched with Jewish support, relied on Jewish support for things like the NAACP and civil rights fights like Brown, Brown versus Education, Nelson Mandela and the ANC, many of those who were arrested in 1963 alongside, alongside Mandela were Jewish. Mm. Uh, and there is a tradition in this country, I think of Stephen Lawrence and John Sentamu and Richard Stone on that inquiry mm. because of that powerful bond that we exist. So the idea that people can tell me now in the Labour Party that I should right. be deselected is but an outrage. I, I agree. But I saw an interview with Jeremy Corbyn where that point was raised, and his answer was not a great defence of David I Lammy. Wasn't, I know. He basically said, "Well, if he's deselected, it shouldn't be for that." Which sort of left me feeling, "Oh, what does he want him deselected for then? <laughs> Why does he just deal with his deselection thing?" I think it's horrible to hold over MPs yeah. the idea that you're going to sort of turf them out. I just, you know, let the electorate do that. I, do, right. I just think, unless there's some really agreeable stuff. But it's part stuff. of the politics of the hard left again. It is, and that's what they care it about. It is. It is, and I, but think, I, but in I, your view, and I'm not asking you to criticise Jeremy. In your view, a lot of those people who've either come into the party and the ones that, the real kind of 
real believe, true believers, are they really, really focused more on power in the party or power in the country? What really gets them going? Actually, Alistair, I think there are, you know, there's a lot of motivation, uh, particularly amongst those young members, to change the country. There is. To deal with the terrible inequality. I agree, for lots to, of them. To deal with the pernicious immigration. I'm talking about the people, who, the people who kind of run in the show. Well, some of those folk were around before. You Certainly know were. those folk. They're, they're, you know, they, they're older than me. I don't hang out with those folk. So I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know where you're going. I know where you're going with this. Yeah, all right. But you're not going to go there, I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, let me bring you back to stuff that you're, you do want to talk about. So if I, t if I take three issues that you've been very closely associated with in recent times, Grenfell, where you really kind of expressed anger for people on that, uh, Windrush more recently, and also Oxbridge and the lack of access for, not just for black kids, but yeah. for working class kids. Yeah. They're all about class, <laughs> aren't they, ultimately? They are. So what does that say about what sort of country? And, and, and also... Looking a bit sort of self-critically, does it mean that we just ultimately we kind of did we didn't quite deliver the meritocratic Britain that we thought we could and would? Oh, there's so much to do. Look, um, at the heart of Grenfell is housing. Yeah. Um, the That's new Labour government that I was part of did not deliver really on housing. Um, and housing has sort of, is now up there almost alongside education. Mm. You know, I'm thinking of constituents who almost are struggling to get an education because they've got nowhere to revise, mm. nowhere to work, mm. they're, they're hand to mouth, they're mm. in rent, um, rented accommodation. It's a nightmare. And for people to burn to death and for that to, you know, a, 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 a friend of mine lost mm. their life in that fire. Um, I thought that was a, a huge moment where Britain had to sort of wake up to a reality. And do you think we have? No. No. No, I don't. So there was an opportunity. There was just a moment after that general election. And then very quickly it turned to this kind of othering. People started to talk about, oh, but they're immigrants. Why were they there? Yeah. Um, it, it got very political, Kensington, Chelsea, and all the rest of it. So, so I mean, look, I... Isn't it also a danger that these really big things happen, like Windrush at the moment, everybody gets very aerated about it, and then we move on to the next big thing? There is, but you... And that's back to the Trump style you, of politics But you as well. made the connection, which is class. Yeah. Which is, which is the pernicious fact that what remains in our country is a reality of people positioned in a certain place. And for me, I say, look, we've lost a powerful sense of what is the good life, what is a quality life. And actually, even when we do talk about class, what we, what we really say, what we really want to talk about is social mobility. Yeah. We really want to say, um, or the middle classes want to say, we want some of you to come and join us. Mm. It's not about how can you have a decent life if you are a cleaner, if you are a dinner lady, if you are a hospital porter, what's the kind of quality of life? What's the promise for you mm. and your family? Mm. I think we've lost sight of that. And that runs across all the issues. That's why it's an outrage, an absolute scandal that the London boroughs of Richmond and Barnet send more people to Oxbridge than um, Leeds, Sheffield, Liverpool, Manchester and combined. And that's not to do with colour. No, that's got nothing to do with colour. That's to do with being working class. You're and actually, about, even you, when kids do get the grades, they don't go, and when they do go, they don't get in, and then you're surprised that they don't apply. And we've not dealt with that. And, let's, and it's not about an elite education, because actually if you just go across the pond to yeah, Harvard 50, and 50. Yale, why, have, why are they cracking it? Hmm. Why have they got kids from Ohio and Arkansas uh, why have they got black kids from Harlem and Watts? Mm. Uh, why are they offer, able to offer bursaries? Come for free if you're bright. We want you to be here. Right, so what's but the Oxford answer? and Cambridge not so able to do the same. Why are they and we are not? Because we are too class bound. Because we are elitist mm. and not elite. That's the difference. Pull up the drawbridge from underneath you. Mm. And actually, worse than that, 
allow middle class people to buy their way to have this access. And how do they do that? They send their kids to public schools, mm. they, they pay their kids with tutors, they move into certain areas and they elbow their way into this mm. and the state is not active enough stopping that nonsense or at least ensuring mm. that there's a fair equity for other folk. And yeah. that's what you've got me now, that's what animates me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's going backwards. Do you feel it's going backwards? Yes. Yeah. It, 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 it's... it's do you, think it, do you think we took it forward? Did we, did we at least move in the right direction even, even if we didn't do enough? On social mobility, I'm talking about. Uh, in a time when the economy was expanding right. and there was 10 successive quarters of growth, we took it forward. Right. But, uh, the, but we did not, I don't think, sufficiently looking back on it, make sufficient structural change. Yeah. Um, uh, I think we bought way too much into... Um, Private sector. The private sector, particularly. Um, wealth at the top. Um, the structural changes that were need, be, needed between north and south. Um, the, the engines of, 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 of growth that cannot solely be about the public sector, yeah, yeah. actually, it seems to me. Um, and some of the systemic ways in which you have to take on the establishment and be desperately unpopular. Mm. I don't think we did enough of in hindsight. Mm. Okay. Um, did you enjoy being a minister? Did you prefer being a backbencher or did you enjoy being a minister? I... I you quite like outrage, don't you? You like a bit of passion. It's, it's, it, what, what I would say is this, I, and this I'm going to talk really honestly and really personally. I think there are, I think there are a ton of black guys in this country, black and brown people, particularly men, who um, aren't great at having a drink after work, um, don't always understand the wheels within wheels that exist in their workplace, um, uh, don't always get the breaks that they might have got, and if they do get them, can't always make the, most of those opportunities. And sometimes you can have the best conversation with a, with a black minicab driver who is so happy because he's running his little minicab, he hasn't got to deal anymore with the boss and the workplace and all the rest of it. And there is definitely a part of David Lammy that's a bit like that. Um, I've said to you, I'm not the best tribal politician. Um, uh, what animates me is affecting change for people. I, I think I'm a pretty good campaigner. Um, but, but do you some enjoy of the, that more than... Well, and I'm also not very good at licking ass. You know, in politics, you have to lick a lot of backside. Who? Oh, God, you've got to... Above you, you know, you got to blow hot air up the prime minister no. or the leader no. or, the, or the minister or the rest that. of it. No, no, I'm just, I'm not personalising. I'm just saying Jeremy. that's how politics works often. No, he doesn't. And so, so I mean, I and I also think if you're a junior minister hmm. doing a lot of grind and getting a lot of grind, um, you know, in some ways that's a, that's a bit thankless. Yeah. Um, so, 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 so basically, you didn't enjoy it that much. And you do like being a campaigner. I enjoyed, I enjoyed making Would change you want, if, in the, in if, the areas that I was responsible right. for. I was, I, you know, higher education, wonderful. Yeah. Um, culture, um, you know, ha all of the things I was responsible for, I did enjoy. But sometimes it was a grind. I couldn't okay. always get that. I couldn't yeah. always achieve the things if, I wanted. If, I wasn't senior, particularly. If, um, I am now, I'm now. I'm now much more seasoned. I know how the thing works. Right. I know how to affect change. So I'm Jeremy, my own person. If Jeremy does become Prime Minister, would you like to be in the Cabinet, Senior Minister, whatever? What I want to do is use the power I've got well, to, well, in to, to, to affect in change. Cabinet. Generally speaking, in government, you have to be on the front right. benches to make things happen. Yeah, so you'd rather uh, do that. But you have to be pretty senior on the front benches to make things happen. Yeah. It's hard, thankless work. So if you're saying, do I relish it? I relish the ability to make people's lives better, but I have three kids and a wife at home. It, there's usually a sacrifice, as you know, at that top level. So let's see. Right. I don't have that today. Okay. I've got balance in my life today. Okay. And um, on the, more in sort of your community and all these kind of, not just in your community, but you know, you've, another thing you've been very, very outspoken on is the whole kind of knife crime, gang culture. Lots of trendy middle-class white people snorting loads of cocaine and not making the link to the black kids <laughs> who are getting mown it. down for That's it. That's right. So how big a problem? How much of that kind of comes across your t desk? 
And again, you know, what the fuck is going on? We've got a serious problem. Um, we, uh, you know, I'm lucky enough to be able to get briefings from the top brass on what's going on. I was with the National Crime Agency um, actually just this week, understanding the realities of organised crime. We have a problem with guns entering our country, um, and those guns are finding their way into the hands of young foot soldiers and gang members in constituencies like mine. So when you, talk, when you say organised crime, and I think kind of mafia and you know these new computer crooks and all the rest of it, you're talking about the running of drugs on the streets. No, no, no. I am talking about organised crime, Alistair. I'm, That's what I mean. Yes, yeah, so I'm saying that one of the byproducts of being the global country that we are yeah. um, is that we have big time crooks and organised criminals who are like the Mafia. They are Eastern European based, they are Middle East based, Turkish East based, and indeed we've got our own domestic organised criminals. Um, and those organised criminals are trafficking drugs yeah. and guns from across the world. Um, let's be absolutely clear, I have young black 16, 17, 18 year olds in Tottenham who are gang members. They don't know where Colombia is. They don't know the transshipment groups. Those drugs come into this country through our ports, through our borders, through lorries and other things organized. They make their way much further down the chain to communities like mine, and then these kids are running county lines um, out right across the country. We have a massive drug problem, it's an 11 billion pound market, and you've not heard any politicians talking about it. They are talking about um, historic um, um, sexual crimes, mm. they are talking about cyber crimes, mm. um, um, they are talking about counter-terrorism, those have been the priorities over the last while. The war on drugs, most people has been, have think have failed. It's not been replaced by anything else. It's it been downgraded. And as a consequence, if you want to know why kids are dying on the streets, that this is the consequence right. of that. Right. And you said there is the eleven billion pound market. Okay. Do you think it should become a market like any other? Do you think it actually should well, be just totally blown open and say, look, let's legalise everything? marketise it and take, make loads of tax off it. This is a GQ interview. There are definitely people watching who know a little bit about cocaine, who know, that you can, who know, who know that it is freely available on WhatsApp groups and house party can I, can I groups and all amazing. the rest of it. I've never, <laughs> apart from in the police station, I've, when it was in Little Pat, I've never seen cocaine in my life. Really? Yeah, never. <laughs> never, ever. But you were a journalist. <laughs> yeah, I've never, ever seen it, ever. Ah, right. Like Montelli. Well, there's, the a, rev station. there's a revelation. There's a revelation. So, so... Um, but you're telling me it's all over the place. It's all over the place. And, and actually, to be fair, it's also been to some extent... <coughs> um, you know, if you're in a dinner party in Notting Hill, I don't think... You know, the police are nowhere in sight. It's, well, it's Cameron, effectively... Cameron and Osborne. Uh, <laughs> Cameron and Osborne, yeah. If you're... If you're if you're Gideon Osborne and you're, at, and you're at that dinner party, um, you know, you're not, the police are nowhere in sight. You're not going to get arrested. So in a sense, it has almost been decriminalised for those communities. For, the white, me, for the white communities. Absolutely. The, the middle class rich Yeah, community. absolutely. But if you're, if you're white in Salford or you're black in Tottenham and you're, and you're walking you're down it. the high road and you're, you're going to get a bloody criminal record and you're going to get banged up. So the point is, the war on drugs isn't happening. That's a class it hasn't issue worked. too. And we do need to have a proper debate about decriminalisation. We do. We've yeah. got to be honest about yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. What a bloody world we're in. Royal wedding. Talking of class. Do you care? Do your people care? Do Tottenham care? Well, I, I actually, um, <laughs> I like. There are these anomalies, and I'm, 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 I, I'm kind of into the royalty. Um, I. You know, I think the Queen does a great job. I do. Yeah, I um, do. I have said before that. But it is sort of, that is the ap apogee of our class system. It is. Really? It is. It is. I know it and is. And we all get excited about a wedding. It is, but I don't, want, our minds I, don't, I don't want a president. I don't want Trump. I don't want. I don't, no. I, 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 I'm pretty down on politicians anyway. Trump and um, the world. And I certainly like Meghan Markle, so. 
I, 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 I'm, I'm up for what is to come. I can't wait to see Meghan's family arrive in for the, Windsor for the wedding. For the wedding, and you know, and, and then I think a lot, well. a, lot, a lot of my, a lot of my constituents are taking great joy. Um, in because this, you in finally this new got, happening. we can finally have a royal of colour. Well, my kids are of mixed race heritage, and yeah. they will see themselves reflected in the new royal family. Yeah. That's good. That's important. Yeah. You mentioned Trump. Trump in a word. We don't want to give him more than a word. I don't think I can say the word uh, on camera. Okay. Um, I think he's, he's the, the biggest. First. He's the biggest narcissist on the planet. Right. And that is dangerous. When you get um, into one of those top jobs, and your your single obsession is you. Mm. You. Every single tweet comes back to him. Mm. Every single policy comes back mm. to him. Sure. When you've got lead, former leaders and directors <clears throat> of the FBI talking almost like having it's like a mafia boss, mm. and it also comes back to the business, mm. this is deeply, deeply corrosive and corrupt. Putin, and Putin then, in a word? Putin's probably the best chess player in the world. That is very, Gary very... Gary Kasparov that, that, says that, that's not true. This is a poker on, player. On a global political level, um, he is out manoeuvring many of us, deeply worrying, another um, sinister narcissist by all accounts as well, um, but... Um, clever. Clever. Uh, and I have to say, when you line up the people who lead this country oh. as against the likes of Putin, mm. and you talk about a deficit in leadership, that's that's a big issue right. for us. And if right, and if Jeremy became prime minister, <laughs> back to Jeremy. Seriously, if he, <laughs> if he becomes prime minister, he's in his pocket already. Let's see. Don't you think he he, he didn't exactly handle the Russian poisoning and the Syria terribly well, did he? Let's be honest. I, I'm going to stick to my policy envelope, which is generally speaking, okay. crime. Education, okay, fine. class. Yeah, we're talking about the guy who's going to be prime minister, and we foreign are, policy is a let, big let, part let, of let, that. Let, let, let's 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 see what happens. Okay. I've said I think people are up Macron, for socialism. Macron, in a word. I hope Macron succeeds. I hope he. I genuinely You're really hope resisting my one word thing, aren't you? I hope he. I hope. Sorry. You're really resisting my one word thing. Let's <laughs> <laughs> go. Yeah, you hope he succeeds. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Theresa, in a word. Weak. Mm. Weak, frozen. Mm. Lacking that humanity you need for politics. Yeah. Mm. Okay. So I'm going to ask you about this because I, I didn't. So, so Nicola, your wife, is an artist. Yes, she is. And that is Barack Obama's head and hands. Yeah. And arms. <laughs> and it's pretty impressive and dramatic. Uh, but he's got. He, has he got the original? Well, Nicola followed the 2008 campaign. She was on his. You know, let into the team, let yeah. behind the scenes. Um, um, spent six months in and around with him, and she produced a series of work. This is one of seven prints. The prints can be found at the National Portrait Gallery in Washington, at the Met in New York, um, and he has some of her collection and. Other people have it, and I'm very lucky to have one of them in my he, office. Did he have, and he had one in the Oval Office at one point. Well, I was with her when she showed him the work in the Oval Office. And look, when I look at that, what I think of is this guy, um, you know, that's almost sort of sacrificed, really. And when, when, she, when she first did this back in 2009, you know, some people looked at it, and it was slightly, you know... Um, I think it was like a skateboard. <laughs> When he saw it, I hope he doesn't mind me saying this, he said, and, he, and you know, he was got quite emotional, and he said, you know, um, I think it sums up me sort of slightly drowning, is what he said. Oh, so what? So you know, the funny thing is what you see in it. Yeah. Um, well. Now it was at the end of the term. Um, I got a sense that he was pretty demod happy to leave yeah, office, yeah, yeah. and that's how he saw it. That's why it's great, isn't it? Because you, you can see, you, now you've said the sacrifice, you can see it. Yeah. But can you see what I mean about it? He's being kind of athletic, he's balancing, and he's. Uh, no, it's great. Well, it actually comes from one of his speeches where he's, you know, he's yeah, obviously yeah, yeah. a great orator and yeah. he's holding the audience as you do, you know, mm. which is a wonderful Who do you think's got a nicer voice, Donald Trump or Barack Obama? <laughs> Who do you think is a better leader, Bill Clinton or Barack Obama? 
Look, I am so, <laughs> so into Barack Obama. He's such a great so guy, did you, such you, a nice guy. Was he at Harvard when you were there? We were not at Harvard at the same time. But I got to know him because he reached out to me when I was in government. Oh, I see, right. Um, and him and a, another good friend of mine, Deval Patrick, yeah. who was the, uh, wanted to be the governor of Massachusetts, black also, were just really interested in what's government like. Yeah. And so we became friends and stayed in contact. Uh, and the rest is, is the rest is history, really. So that's how we got to know each right. other. And we've, you know, we've remained very much in contact. Do you know, do you... What is it about the Americans that, I mean, there's Trump sort of abusing him the whole time, abusing Hillary the whole time, abusing Bill the whole time. They never answer back. Obama never answers back. Well... He's play, still playing by the rules. Yes. With the president who doesn't play by the yeah, rules. Yeah, I know, but then you sort of, you, you just lower yourself down to that horrible common denominator, mm. and it all becomes incredibly grubby and mm. nasty and horrible. Mm. Mm. And, you know... For, for, the general view is that former presidents have to rise above that. Yeah. yeah. And Hillary doesn't fall into that category. But, but, for, but for Bill and, uh, and, uh, and Obama, they have to sort of rise above mm. that. We don't want them grubbing around with, with Trump. Yeah. So finally, Mr. Lammy, or David Lammy as you call yourself. <laughs> uh, the third the, person, the, the, uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury failed to persuade me that I should do God. So just tell me about this God... This God God's thing. thing, yeah. God for me is cultural. You know, um, it goes back to growing up um, poor, uh, growing up in a in a context of dislocation, which was common for a lot of sort of second generation Black West Indian immigrants. And God for me was somewhere where we, we you know we would we would get ready for church, we'd look all smart, we'd go, we'd sing. Uh, with strangers who then became friends. Um, I really love singing, um, so much so that I became a kind of Hello. young, black, yeah. Alid Jones and a, and, a, and a cathedral chorus. So I was very much a sort of Billy Elliot um, uh, figure. It wasn't a tutu, it was a, it was a dress. Um, and so for me, that is deeply cultural. I, but, you know, did, but do you believe the story of Jesus? The Archbishop told me that th it was all about believing the story of Jesus. I do actually. I'm I, I, I'm comfortable with the story of Jesus. This kid, um, born a refugee, um, in a in basically a sort of squalid little outhouse, surrounded by crap and animals. Um, Virgin birth. <laughs> Come on, you want, to, you want to be the first black archbishop? You're going to have to. I don't want to, be have to get I, with I, the program. I'm not, who said I was ready for archbishop? <laughs> I'm comfortable with that tradition. And, and also I'm really comfortable with a tradition that is, for me, about, you know, Martin Luther King and, and, and others. I take a lot from that. Yeah. More seriously, I don't underestimate, you know, to do the job that I have to do, to speak up for the voiceless in Grenfell, to comfort those families, um, as, I, as I have very recently, who have lost children stabbed on the streets of London, to um, call it as it is um, in the House of Commons to the Prime Minister on behalf of the Windrush generation who were being royally shafted, frankly, after all that they gave to this country, to handle the corridors of power as a, as a young minister, you know, to walk into a room um, with civil servants who are all white, they bring their own stereotypes about you and, and have expectations to you to, to, to deal with a set of journalists who also are all white, all middle class, they're not you, um, to cope under that pressure to have a young family, um, to get married, all of that stuff. I have had to rely on my faith. I could not have done it without my faith. I could not have done it without that tradition that is a broader kind of black diasporic tradition and in that sense um, you know partly when I say I'm not the tribal Labour politicians that others have it's because I'm very proud to be able to lean in to other traditions mm. African-American, West Indian, Caribbean, 
um, to hang with people like, um, you know, to learn from people like Trevor McDonald, Lenny Henry, these kind of guys. You know, in that sense, I'm, I'm, I, you know, that's where I'm from. Uh, and my Christian faith is, is a part of that for me.